Thank you very much for the introduction. I should have taken the headset so I could hear all the things I've done and make sure it was me being introduced. But um, let me begin by thanking um, Ana Ortega and um, UNESCO for inviting me to this forum. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege for me to be here to talk to you about the issue of development, um, sustainability, and language diversity. I think we're at a critical transition period now, this particular year. This last year, 2015, marked a watershed um, in two global development agendas, which expired. The first is the um, MDGs, or the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which are replaced, as you know, by the Sustainable Development Goals, which will set the global development agenda for the next 15 years until 2030. Meanwhile, there's a related uh, education agenda, namely Education for All, or EFA, um, which also came to an end, and we have a new education development agenda uh, called the Education 2030 Framework for Action. So we're at an important crossroads now. Um, recognizing the important role of education as a main driver of development, this new vision for education pledges to leave no one behind. Um, and it embraces sustainable development goal number four, to ensure equitable uh, and inclusive quality education and lifelong learning for all by 2030. So this gives us, I think, a very timely opportunity to reflect on what's been achieved or not been achieved over the past 15 years and to look ahead, most importantly, to what remains to be done by these new um, agendas which take over for the next 15 years. Um, the new 17 sustainable development goals are even more ambitious, and they promise to improve the world in a sustainable way. But of course, sustainability is a buzzword. We need to look carefully at what this means. But more importantly, um, the new 17 Sustainable Development Goals, like the Millennium Development Goals, fail to acknowledge the central role of language, linguistic diversity, multilingualism in the global deba debate on poverty, sustainability, and equity. And that gap, or that omission, is the main reason for my being here today to talk about this. So first, I'm going to take a brief snapshot of the two agendas that just expired um, and tell you why language matters to those agendas and to the agendas going forward. Well, this is a very brief uh, attempt to give a kind of scorecard to show you where we are. Um, with the two expiring agendas. I'll say a bit more about this later, but I thought it would be helpful just to show you that progress was highly variable across goals, targets, countries, and regions, and there are big shortfalls still in education, health, and gender equality. So some goals were met globally, but the problem is not all countries met all the goals, so we still have big gaps. Okay, and again, just showing you a brief snapshot that I'll go into in more detail later of outcomes from the EFA agenda. Um, note what was not achieved, especially in two interrelated areas where the MDG and EFA agendas overlap, namely universal primary education. This is uh, MDG2 and EFA2. Um, the target was not achieved, so if you just look at the uh, pie chart for EFA2, um, that wasn't achieved. There's still a gap. Almost 50% of countries didn't achieve that. And no country has achieved sustainable economic growth without achieving near universal primary education. So it's a very important goal. Um, I'll comment on this in, in more detail later. So, summarizing the unfinished business of these two agendas and the unkept promises to the world, um, global poverty levels are continuing to fall, but we're still failing to reach the most vulnerable. And in 2015, there were still nearly a billion extremely poor people 
living under the so-called international poverty line of a dollar and a quarter a day. And on the education side, 263 million children and adolescents still out of school. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people uh, who are the global poor live in two regions, Southwest Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. The most disadvantaged children are still those furthest from achieving universal primary completion. Now, I've put some of these data on the map to show you that the poorest regions, which you see in the um, left-hand chart, also have the highest number of children out of school and the lowest literary, literacy rates, which uh, you see on the right-hand side, the two um, charts from UNESCO. So the left shows the Human Development Index from 2015, and the top right shows, uh, according to UNESCO, the adult literacy rates. The bottom right shows youth literacy rates. And the worst performing areas are those that appear in red, orange, and yellow. So all three maps are showing you different indicators, but showing you that these are the worst performing areas of the world. Now, if we look at um, individual indicators or targets or sustainable development goals one at a time, um, you miss the larger picture of cumulative disadvantage experienced by particular groups. So now, when we ask the question, what does language have to do with sustainable development, the short answer is everything if you look at who got left behind by the Millennium Development Goals and Education for All. And here's where language comes very prominently into the picture. A vicious circle of intersecting disadvantages pushes language minorities into the bottom billion left behind by development. So sometimes we say a rising tide lifts all boats, but what we see here is, is not that. Uh, we see the rising tide swamping the poorest and the weakest. So the rich get richer, but the poor don't remain merely poor. They become even poorer as they wind up in what uh, economist Paul Collier calls the bottom billion. Now, speaking a minority language, in effect, constitutes an economic, social, and health risk because ethno-linguistic minorities comprise a large proportion of the bottom 20%, still living in extreme poverty, suffering from poor health, lack of education, and deteriorating environments. So that sh sums up, in a nutshell, uh, where we are today. Um, the problem... I think we need to face here, and I hope we will face at this forum, is that we urgently need changes in policy and practice, especially in the education sector. And if we don't implement these changes, it is going to increase the likelihood that linguistic minorities will continue to be the majority of those living in poverty uh, beyond 2015. And this applies not just to the developing world, but to the world as a whole. So that is why the UN must do more than simply renew or repledge itself to the same framework. Bad policies, no matter how well they're funded, won't work. And here is why. Um, because language impacts the whole development enterprise, language matters more than ever to what was MDG 8, or what has now become Goal 17 in the new agenda. In other words, developing global partnerships for development. The poorest of the poor speak most of the world's languages, and indigenous peoples are particularly vulnerable. Um, they comprise a small amount of the world's population, but a large, a disproportionately um, percentage of the world's very poor people. They also speak around 60% of the world's languages. Um, indigenous peoples were more or less invisible in the MDGs, and I would say that they're nearly invisible, not completely uh, invisible, but nearly completely invisible in the SDGs. So we risk um, repeating their negative experiences um, and further, further marginalization in the post-2015 development agenda. So I think there can be no true development without linguistic development. Uh, the most linguistically diverse countries around the world contain almost three-quarters of children out of school worldwide. 
And we know that most languages are currently excluded from education and other higher domains of public life. Almost everybody acknowledges clear links between a good education and a broad range of benefits impacting poverty, health, gender inequality, and so on. But unfortunately, there's still very limited recognition of the role of language as an intervening variable in the development process. Discriminating against the languages of the marginalized poor severely compromises the power of education to improve the lives of millions of poor whose languages are excluded from school. Failure to take language into account means that the goal of education for all effectively becomes schooling for some. And this disadvantage is found not just in these two regions I've highlighted, but it's found across the globe in virtually all countries of the world. If you look at the outcomes of education, those who are relatively well off, those who come from the dominant group in their respective country, get more and they get better returns from education than do the poor and uh, ethno-linguistic minorities. Now, the um, result of such policies is in effectively a lost generation of children in the world's poorest countries who's whose life chances have been damaged by failure to protect their right to quality education. Progress in reducing the number of children out of school has virtually stalled in some parts of the world, like sub-Saharan Africa. Um, many children will never go to school in this part of the world. I want to focus um, very briefly on the development landscape in Africa to show you how this plays out in what is, in effect, the linguistically richest but economically poorest region on Earth. Africa, of course, is particularly disadvantaged in the development race. Um, Africa started way behind, and not surprisingly, it finishes last if we look at the Millennium Development Goals. People often talk about the Africanization of, of poverty, which, of course, underlines the enormity of the gap between Africa and developed countries. But here's where language comes into the picture. Um, Africa has the highest proportion of people without access to mother tongue education. Some 90% of Africans have no knowledge of the official language of their country, even though it's presumed to be the language in which the government communicates with its citizens. So Africa's marginalization from development is perpetuated by almost complete exclusion from the global cultural flow of information. And that leaves the majority of people disempowered and disenfranchised from political participation. Um, People talk about geographies of knowledge and information inequalities. I won't go into all the information on this slide, but again, this is to just to show you the disparities. And of course, these disparities affect all countries uh, to some extent. Um, if we look at Africa, for instance, uh, fewer than 20% of Africans use the internet. Uh, there's very low internet penetration rate. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this, cost, infrastructure, and so on. The price of the internet is, it costs more than what most Africans earn. But um, if we were to try to close what people call the digital divide, that means we've also got to solve the language divide. And then we just take another look um, at, an, at another measure of... Um, disparities in provision of knowledge in the world's language. Um, Wikipedia is only as rich as your language. Um, Wittgenstein said, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Of course, he wasn't talking about Wikipedia. But um, if you look at uh, Wikipedia, you'll see that a majority of the content produced in Wikipedia is about a relatively small part of our planet, and it's available in only a handful of the world's languages. Um, Africa is, is the second largest, the second most populous continent. It has um, over a billion people. It has over a third of the world's languages. So African languages have many speakers, but low literacy rates mean Africa has few readers and writers in any language. Um, and when you look at 
African languages, um, there's very little content, even if people were able to read it in their own language. And I've compared a few um, uh, examples here that I've just pulled from Wikipedia statistics. So 50 million Hausa speakers have only 1,300 pages of content compared to nearly half a million pages for only 5 million speakers of Norwegian. Um, Basque, according to Wikipedia, has 262,000 um, pages. So Basque is, is not doing badly, but of course much less well provisioned than um, other minorities that have no territorial base or government support in Europe. Okay, so these are some of the um, inequities. Okay, when we look um, more specifically at linguistic diversity and how it interfaces with poverty, um, most of Africa's languages, over 2,000 languages and its poor, are concentrated in six of the world's 20 most linguistically diverse countries. And that's what you, those are the countries you see in this table. And altogether, they contain 20% of the world's languages and two-thirds of all the languages in Africa. And of course, there are numerous ethnic and minority language groups here which uh, make up a large proportion of these. And these um, speakers of these minority languages make up a large proportion of the so-called bottom billion. Um, and they make up a large proportion of those who have the fewest years of schooling. So I've put a few other indicators here, um, like life expectancy at birth, mean years of schooling, percent of the population below the poverty line. Um, in Nigeria, for example, more, there are more children out of school there than anywhere else in the world. Um, the, the dominant uh, minority group are Hausa speakers, 65% um, of them, they comprise one-fifth of the population, have no education. And altogether, if you look at these six countries, um, children receive an average of only four years of schooling. And remember, an average is just an average. If we look at the worst, some get a year or less. And of course, there are many out of school. Now, getting more of these children into school without changing the language of instruction is not going to solve the problem. Providing quality education to the poorest means teaching through the language they understand best. This is common sense, I think, to probably all of us in this room, but unfortunately, this common sense principle is still the exception rather than the rule worldwide. Uh, children learn better in a language they already know, and learning to read is the most critical thing that children need to do in education to access the rest of the content of the curriculum. Um, mother tongue programs can produce competent readers in two to three years rather than five or more that are typical of many second language programs. And we know uh, that research uh, from other countries shows that the more highly developed children's mother tongues are, the better prepared they are to learn second languages successfully. Submersion models, on the other hand, that plunge children into a second language with no instruction or support in their first language are a recipe for persistent, if not permanent, underdevelopment. They'll continue to produce a large class, uh, underclass of almost 90%, who will finish below the mean with insufficient skills for doing anything but manual labor. Literacy matters. <clears throat> and the push toward universal primary education in the context of the Millennium Development Goals and Education for All obscures an even greater crisis that I've alluded to, namely um, those out of school. But if you look at those who are in school, there are more than 250 million children in school who haven't achieved basic literacy skills due to poor quality of schooling. Uh, not surprisingly, Africa here has the highest percentage of illiterate youth, and I showed you the um, map based on UNESCO st statistics a moment ago. But here's the, here's the issue. Across a continent like Africa, with very high dropout rates, very high repetition rates, fewer than half of African pupils remain to the end of primary school what have five decades of instruction through English, Portuguese, or French done 
for African children. I would say they've done very little, um, nor can they do very much. Um, I read an interesting study that came out just this last year which shows that income inequality is significantly higher in countries using colonial languages as the medium of instruction. Um, I'm not surprised at all by that. Now, girls are the first to be excluded. Um, gender inequalities are the most pervasive of all inequalities. And the uh, Millennium Development goal, uh, Goals aimed at achieving gender parity in primary education and in education more generally. Um, but that wasn't, that wasn't achieved. That was, that's one of the big, that was one of the big gaps that remains. So it remains unfinished business for the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda too. Uh, speaking a minority language compounds female marginalization. Minority girls face numerous disadvantages, both as a group and as a subgroup of the disadvantaged. Uh, nearly three quarters of the girls out of school belong to ethnic, religious, and linguistic, or other minorities. And the poorest girls, virtually everywhere in the world, remain the most likely to never attend primary school or never to complete it. And I've given you just a few examples here from Africa. Um, again, uh, if we look at, 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 at Hausa speakers, 65% uh, of Hausa speakers uh, have no education, 97% of poor Hausa girls, and over 90% of rural Hausa women um, between the ages of 17 and 22 have fewer than two years of education. Now, um, this is a problem that affects the more developed world too. Um, we find similar gender disparities affecting girls, and they affect girls belonging to ethno-linguistic minorities more so than uh, other girls. And uh, if you look at the photo that I've taken from, from a report uh, in the upper left-hand corner, um, if you didn't already know that this slide looks at the situation of the Roma in Europe, that could be a photo from sub-Saharan Africa. It's absolutely sh shocking that in a highly developed part of the world, we would find these disparities and children and their families living in such conditions. But if you look at the Roma, and I I've taken the Roma um, as an example here, because they're the largest minority group of around 10 to 12 million people, concentrated primarily in Central and Eastern Europe, but um, they're a non-territorial minority. And as I indicated earlier, territorial minor minorities that can claim a territorial base have generally fared better, um, both with respect to policy, initi uh, policy initi initiatives for language and other development agendas. Those without a territorial base uh, fare much worse. You may know that uh, we've just completed a so-called decade of Roma inclusion. It ran from 2005 to 2015. Twelve European governments pledged to close the gap between Roma and non-Roma within 10 years. So there are huge gaps uh, in literacy and numeracy levels. Um, and as you can see from some of the, the facts that I've put on the slide, uh, Roma children have only one-third the rate of literacy and numeracy skills that uh, children from the dominant group in these countries have. Uh, shockingly, the primary school enrollment rate for Roma girls is only 64% compared to 96% for girls in non-Roma communities. Three quarters of Roma women don't complete primary education compared with only a fifth of women from majority communities. So these, these shocking statistics and disparities are found uh, all across the globe um, and right, right here in Europe. Okay, so literacy in mother tongues, literacy in local languages is key to sustainable development. It's a core component of the right to education. It's an indispensable prerequisite to lifelong learning. The Dakar framework for action, uh, which led to the education for all goals, stressed the importance of local languages for initial literacy. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to have been, to seem to have been followed through. 
either in the EFA agenda or in the Millennium Development Goal agenda. But um, even a 10% increase in the share of students who achieve basic literacy translates into a higher annual growth rate. The other side of that coin is that illiteracy is, is costly, so it detracts from uh, gross domestic product, it detracts from what can be achieved in the global economy. And no country anywhere has achieved uh, continuous and rapid economic growth without first having at least 40% of adults able to read and write. Uh, EFA goal four aimed to increase adult literacy, but this was in fact one of the most neglected of all EFA goals. Um, only a quarter of countries achieved the target, and unfortunately that leaves us with over 750 million adults lacking minimum literacy skills. Two thirds of these are women, so again, women are first to be left behind. Half of women in South and West Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa can't read or write. And this, of course, is the legacy of um, inequalities and restricted education opportunities that begin in childhood. Now, um, I've spent a lot of time talking about um, the cost of being left behind in, uh, by these inequities in access to good quality education that could provide knowledge and skills. And I want to emphasize with this slide that the cost of being left behind is as high as human life itself, because health is related to every other aspect of development. I won't go into all the, the details here, but Africa carries the highest burden of HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see some statistics here about um, what's going on in, in Africa. And if you look at the chart on the, the left, um, this shows you that it's in fact the same groups most marginalized by the education gap, namely poor girls and women, especially those belonging to ethnic and linguistic minorities, who are less likely how to know to prevent uh, infection and spread of HIV. Now that knowledge is vital to MDG6 and the new more general SDG goal of good health and well-being uh, to combat uh, infectious disease. And in fact, um, there are similar knowledge gaps among the Roma. Uh, the same study that I, that I cited a moment ago, looking at some of the outcomes of this decade of supposed inclusion for Roma, shows you that it's in effect girls and women who have the least knowledge of how to prevent HIV and other um, infections. Now, I also draw your attention to the, um, the photo at the upper right. Well, this, this is in Africa, but um, now you see English here in the signs. Well, what good does English do? What good does communicating this knowledge in English do if 90% of the population in some countries have no access to that language or to other colonial languages or indeed to literacy of any kind? So NGOs, I think, are delivering humanitarian aid also need to make sure they deliver it in appropriate formats, oral formats, and in local languages that people can understand. Okay, well, um, I've talked a lot about the cross-cutting effects of uh, linguistic diversity on virtually all aspects of uh, human welfare. Um, and the conclusion I draw from that is that um, Global development agendas cannot reach the bottom billion until they speak to them in their own languages. But let's look now at whether the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, will be up to the challenge of addressing those inequalities. Um, well, the answer to that question, of course, depends on who you ask. Um, last year, in the run-up to the SDGs, there was much, much criticism, and I, I just gave you um, a few quotes, uh, I won't go into all of them here, uh, people who were very critical about the development agenda. Uh, you might like to look at the one in the middle from Richard Horton, who's editor of The Lancet, which is one of the prominent British medical journals, where he talks about the SDGs being fairy tales dressed up in the bureaucraties of intergovernmental narcissism, the robes of multilateral paralysis, the acid of nation-state failure, and so on. Yes, it, it's 
it's witty, but um, seriously, I think I'm inclined to agree with um, the last quote on this slide from Keith Lewin, who's an educator, when he says, the staggering claim that we have mapped the road to sustainable development in one short document sounds like a triumph of aspiration over cartography. Okay, so what is this agenda and what are we likely to see from it? Is it simply more of the same? Um, well, again, that depends on who you ask. The International Council for Science um, did a review of the SDGs and they found that only 29% of the 169 targets are well-defined and scientifically rigorous. Um, that's not a very good scorecard, really. Um, at that stage, only 149 of the indicators had been agreed. The other 80 were gray, meaning that they lacked full agreement. But the problem with the SDG agenda, even now that it's going forward, is that uh, there are way too many goals, 17 goals, way too many targets, 169 targets, 229 indicators. Um, that's an awful lot to try to take on. Um, not all the SDGs are um, fully measurable. Some lack data, some lack an agreed upon methodology, and that, that's particularly significant um, because the MDG report in 2015 said what gets measured gets done, but if we can't measure something, how do we know how to do it or whether it's done or not? Well, this is a good example, and the um, International Council for Science, in fact, singled out this goal, number 16, from the SDG agenda as particularly empty. I mean, it's a nice goal. Uh, who, who among us would not agree with this? But how on earth would we measure this? Um, there's nothing really specific in it. Um, how, would we go, how would we go about doing it? Now, it's also important to remember that targets that have very little chance of being met are unlikely to receive political commitment, support from government, donors, NGOs, etc. It's also important to remember that the SDGs, like the MDGs, are a voluntary agreement among countries, so they don't have the force of international law behind them. So no matter how nice they sound, um, there's no compulsion to them. Okay, well, I want to concentrate now on the one that I think is the most relevant for us, namely, this is goal four, uh, quality education. This goal uh, also has problems. It's got 10 targets, 11 indicators. And uh, let me just take a couple of illustrations um, to show you some of the problems. Um, and I'm picking those that have particular implications for language. So if we look at target 4.1, uh, by 2030, ensure that all girls and boys complete free, equitable, quality, primary, and secondary education. Okay, well, um, that's nice, and who of us wouldn't agree with it, but um, ensuring universal secondary education for all countries in the next 15 years, I would think, is beyond the reach of most countries. Only half of countries, if you recall, managed to achieve universal primary education, so there's a big gap there. And if you, I mean, if you look even at Europe or North America, more developed parts of the world, um, even these countries have not achieved universal secondary education. Um, so there's a lot, a, a lot here to take on, and it's perhaps a goal that's too ambitious. Now, if we look at uh, target 4.7, Again, I think th this expresses what for me would be a utopian vision, and I think all of us here would agree with this. Um, and it talks about a lot of nice things like sustainable development. And if you read the last bit uh, there, it also talks about global citizenship, appreciation of cultural diversity, of culture's contribution to sustainable development. Well, yes, this sounds very good, and who of us wouldn't like to see this? But unfortunately, this is really one of the very few places where cultural diversity and culture's contribution to sustainable development is mentioned. Okay, so this is a huge uh, omission, uh, what I've called the missing dimension in this slide, linguistic cultural diversity. Um, and I've cited um, two 
lessons from this MDG report in 2015. These are two lessons that supposedly the United Nations has learned after being through the MDG agenda. And I'm going to take them each one by one to show you that I don't think these lessons have been learned at all. Okay, so the first is um, the MDG focus on poverty reduction without paying attention to the pathway or enablers, and the second one has to do with finance. Okay, so um, let's look first at poverty reduction, which uh, is central to the post-2015 agenda, um, just as it was to MDG 1. But MDG 1 um, proposed to reduce poverty by half, MDG uh, or SDG 1, as you can see, proposes to eradicate it. So it's much more uh, ambitious. Now, um, there are at least two ways in which poverty uh, eradication could be accelerated. I don't think we'll ever get rid of poverty, but let's just talk about accelerating it. Um, one, of course, is you could increase the growth rate of the global economy as a whole and hope that that would trickle down to the poorest. Um, or you could increase the share of global growth going to the poorest households. That is, you could try to change the global income distribution so that it benefited the poorest. Um, economist Ann Kruger, uh, who worked for both the World Bank and the IMF, endorsed the prevailing model of economic development when she said, poverty reduction is best achieved through making the cake bigger not by trying to cut it up in a different way. Well, I don't agree with this, but I think this, this idea, this mental image of the cake or the pie being cut up in different ways is a useful one to think about. Um, but during the MDG years of 2000 to 2015, the poorest half of the world's population got just 1% of that cake or 1% of the pie, whichever uh, you prefer. And that is 1% increase in total global wealth. Half of that increase went to the top 1% of people. Now, if inequality within countries had not grown during that period, another 200 million people could have been lifted out of poverty. So instead of trickling down, income and wealth are being sucked up at an alarming rate. Inequality is reaching new extremes. And the, the, this inequality, I think, is driving a, a lot of populist, right-wing national movements. Um, and we see this happening in Europe. We see it happening in the United States, everywhere. Inequality is one driver of this. Um, and the right-wing movements fuel a lot of anti-immigrant uh, resentment, resentment at the rich, and so on. Uh, Ox, one of Oxfam's latest policy briefings, An Economy for the 1%, talks about the problem of having an economy that works only for this 1% of the world who are the richest, rather than an economy that works for all of us. Um, and they talk about the fact that in 2015, 62 people, almost all of them men, had the same wealth as the poorest 3.6 billion people. So this is a terrible state of affairs, and it didn't just happen. Um, it happened as a result of policies favoring the dominant economic world order, which will never be inclusive or sustainable. And that's the, that's the model that Ann Kruger is talking about. Um, and I've quoted from an article by David Wo Woodward, which I think is rather interesting and puts the sustainable development goals into perspective. He says that, for the poorest two-thirds of humanity to receive only a dollar and a quarter a day, global gross domestic product would need to increase to nearly 15 times its 2010 level, and it would take at least 100 years. If you take a more realistic goal of $5 a day, um, you'd need to increase GDP 173 times, um, and that would take 200 years. So this isn't realistic. And again, if you think about the cake or the pie metaphor, baking a cake this big or a pie this big would entail an unsustainable increase in global production and consumption, even if we could do it. Um, it would cause irreparable damage to ecosystems, the planet, and so on. And the losers in such a scenario would again be the poorest whom we're trying to help. 
um, those who live in areas most vulnerable to climate change, but yet who are, who are not responsible for most of the global emissions um, that are produced by developing countries. Um, and the same is true not just in the uh, developing world, but it's true in the developed world too. If you look at Europe, um, studies done by people working on environmental sustainability show that it, in fact it's the poor and minority households who are already suffering more from air pollution because they live closer to waste disposal, they live waste disposal plants, they live closer to um, factories that emit uh, more pollution and so on. So this is all going to get much worse if we keep on the path of business as, usable, uh, as usual. So if we ask whether the SDG development is sustainable and in what way its vision of sustainable development is different from development, I would say that it's in effect offering the disease as the cure. In other words, it's saying, okay, growth will solve the problems of poverty and the environmental crisis it's given rise to in the first place. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, if we come back now to this second lesson that was supposedly learned, but I don't think has been learned, um, it has to do with finance. And I want to concentrate just on the resources required to meet the edu education goals. And um, the problem here is you see that uh, donors didn't keep their promises. They didn't give what they said they would give. So there's a huge age, uh, a huge age shortfall for education goals. Reaching the most marginalized and not, uh, and not leaving the most vulnerable behind is gonna cost more. Estimates range from 22 to nearly 39 billion, but that's at least four times more than, than is being spent now. AIDS also not going where it's needed most. Countries don't spend enough. Donors don't give enough. They don't direct their aid to the neediest. And of course, there's a big politics of aid that I don't have time to go into. Uh, many countries divert uh, money to military spending that they could have been spending on education. Many other countries um, also spend more waste uh, money spent on resource extraction that could have gone to education. Um, investment in education could yield a higher return for peace and stability than military spending. If we take Syria, the country which is in the news every hour of every day, two years of conflict, and what we're into, what, six years of conflict, but only two years of conflict erased 15 years of education progress. And military conflicts have global ramifications. And of course, we see that here in Europe because conflict in Syria is the biggest driver of migration to Europe. And you see the memorial to Alan, Alan Kurdi in the upper left-hand corner, the um, Kurdish boy from Syria who drowned in 2015 while his family was trying to get to Greece. Um, Europe's failure to address, um, not just Europe, but the global community's failure to address uh, the crisis in Syria as I said, is behind this migration. And then within the EU, which seems to go from one crisis to another, the failure to come up with a coherent policy is, it means that in effect, um, we've got now a young generation of lost children um, living in refugee camps and settlement areas. Um, what are we doing about the education of these children? And again, uh, aid is not going to reach these children unless it's delivered in the languages they speak. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, I'm not actually optimistic about changing the SDG agenda at this stage. I mean, that, that train is already running. However, there is something we can do. One is that there's consensus at virtually every level, uh, from the poorest family in the most remote village to all global policy leaders who are shaping the world's development agendas, and that is that education matters. So why can't we open the schoolhouse door and look inside and address the issue of, of language? Okay, and again, I just point to the fact that multi mother tongue-based multilingual education can offer a bridge to sustainable development. 
it can achieve more than it's being achieved now with current education policies. And uh, I applaud UNESCO because, of course, they've been at the forefront of trying to make this point, all going back to the early 1950s with their document on uh, vernacular language education. Other um, documents have come out since then. Um, so these facts are not unknown to the development community. Why can't we get them into these important global agendas? The bottom right, you see the World, the World Bank issued this important education note in 2005. In 2011, they changed their focus from education for all to learning for all, and they had a great pub, supposedly public input, and I, I suggested to them they needed to earmark funds for mother tongue-based multilingual education. They needed to incorporate language indicators like percentage of children receiving education through their mother tongue into national benchmarks for education. Well, uh, the World Bank, needless to say, doesn't listen to me. Um, so where do we go now with this commitment? No target met unless met for all. Um, this is what the Incheon Declaration said in 2015. We therefore commit to making the necessary changes in education policies, focusing our efforts on the most disadvantaged, especially those with disabilities, to ensure that no one is left behind. Okay, well, here's where we come back again to language minorities. Okay, and being a minority, an ethno-linguistic minority, intersects with all these other um, disadvantages that these agendas are focused on. Why can't we make uh, language more prominent? Well, I think, again, UNESCO is doing good work. Um, in this area, but there's still no provisions relating to language adopted uh, for inclusion in the SDG indicators. The Incheon Declaration, however, did mention um, using as an indicator 1% of students in primary ed whose first language is the language of instruction. Um, but of course, for that, we need data. We don't really have data from around the world on the number of um, children, in what kinds of programs, and so on and so forth. So we need a, a lot more um, information. And I'm happy to say that the UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report has adopted this principle as thematic indicator uh, 18. But what can we do? I think we can lobby ministries of education to conduct uh, censuses of schools to see what's going on. Uh, we can lobby NGOs who are doing on the ground work um, to get information from them about what's going on in individual parts of the world. But finally, I'll just leave you with uh, my last thought here, namely, all of us, I think, are committed to a more just uh, world, one in which language is central to human rights. And I think we must all be tireless in our efforts to change the prevailing normative fr framework on development so that linguistic diversity is included in the future that we all want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mila Mila Esker Benetan utzi dizkigu gogoetarako eta lanerako makina bat harimutur ondoren jarraituko diegu, bi egun baditugu horretarako ere, baino orain tartetxo bat egingo dugu, kafe tartetxoa izango da, amaika tardietan bueltan izango gara eta orduan ekingo diogu gaur goizeko bigarren tarteari, Protokoloaren txanda izango da eta izango da gainera zertaz itzegina eta zertaz gogoeta egina luze eta zabalorain. Kafe tartetxoa esan bezala, hemen ondoan duzue, ordu erdiz, eskertzei zuet bueltan ere puntu aletorri zana.